first of all, before we get into the video, I want to say thank you all very much for hitting that subscribe button. We're up over 100 now. Didn't honestly think that many people would be interested in watching videos that I put out, so thank you all very much. Apologies for not putting up a video last week. This one, for some reason, took me way longer to compile clips for than I thought it would. I'm going to try and get one up every week from now on, at least until work starts, so that'll be the whole summer. So this week's video is going to be some tips and tricks that I have sort of come up with or heard other people say over the course of the last eight, actually it's almost ten months now since I got back into the hobby, so wow. Hopefully you enjoy this little tips and trick video. Um, if you have a tip that I didn't think of, put it down in the comments so we can have a conversation and I can try it out. Alright, so for the first tip slash trick, we're going to talk about sponges. Now, sponges can be used from for a range of things, ranging from simply putting them in your filter to putting them on your intake. You can use them to clean. You can take them out and help you cycle other tanks. I've used them to seal holes on decor before. So they come in a wider range of sides, as you can see. Sides? Not sides. Sizes. Um, I have the Aqua Clears ranging from the 20 gallon size, which are these nice small little sponges here. I don't know, it's probably three inches tall, maybe. Maybe by, uh, not too, too wide? I don't know if there's any size on this box. Probably not. But these ones are good for smaller filters if you have like a, uh, like a five or ten gallon filter. Probably be perfect for it. I have them in uh, two of my filters at the moment. Uh, we have the 30 gallon size, which is slightly larger. Not by much though. They're just a little taller. Most of these are the same width. They just get slightly taller, so that's a little taller. Uh, I have the 50 and then the 70 gallon. I don't know if I've used the 70s yet. Now these are designed for the AquaClear line of filter. I don't own an AquaClear filter. I own with Tetra's, uh, Tidal, Seachem's, Popfin's, and Aquamarine, I think. But you can put these in your filters no problem. And then here's the big size. I don't have a 70 gallon. But it says for 40 to 70. Yeah, I haven't used any of these yet. This is a nice giant sponge. So if you have a bigger tank, this probably would fit in my Tidal Seachem, which is a 55, or my 40 gallon. So that's a nice big sponge. But again, same thickness all the way through. So if you need to stack them, you can stack them. You can cut them. Uh, I used one of these on my beta tank to put it on an intake sponge because the the um, top fin intakes are wider so it's harder to get the standard pre-filter sponge on them so I just retrofitted mine okay, I really hope I press record this time because I've tried to film this part like four times and I keep forgetting to press it okay so one of the tips for sponges is cleaning glass or plastic or whatever you have so this is my two and a half gallon with a beta in it it's a little dirty from algae on the front so we're gonna take our sponge and we're gonna take our aquascaping tweezers and we're going to take this sponge and stick it right in between or you can put it the other way but I'm gonna put it this way for now you can give it a little squeeze if you want to have a little more secure but then you're just gonna take it you're gonna come over to your tank here and you can just go up and down on the glass and uh, give it a little clean now the good thing about using sponges for this is you don't have to worry about scraping it you don't have to worry about really buying anything, because if you already have sponges with you, you're fine. It's just a nice little cheap, cost-effective way to clean your tanks. If you have a bigger tank, this might not work so well, but any more with a smaller tank, like even 10 and under, probably fine. If your allergy is close to the top on a bigger tank, it'd also be good. And it's just a quick little easy way to clean it. You don't have to put anything in the tank, and you can use a different sponge for each tank. You can buy a couple boxes of the small sponges here and just dedicate a sponge for every tank instead of having to worry about cross-contamination between your tanks you have the same sponge and you're all set so this guy's tank is clean now from algae that I could get out without moving stuff so yeah he's all set now another thing is if you are setting up a new tank you can take these sponges from other tanks and kind of stick them in your other tanks or stick them in inside other filters so that you don't have to worry about cycling taking so long. The other good thing about these is you don't have to use those replacement cartridges. So if your filter uses a replacement cartridge, you can still just use these. And as you can see, the sponge goes in, easy enough to take out. When they get dirty, you can just clean them. This is probably due to be cleaned, but I got a couple in here just to fill it up and keep the water flow nice and small. And then I can take that sponge and plop it in another tank. 
or you can leave it in that tank while it cycles and not have to worry about it. I got the same thing over here. This is actually a new sponge in this one because I took the sponge out of here and stuck it in a different tank to help it cycle. So that's the nice thing about sponges. You can move them between tank and tank. And again, this isn't even an aqua clear and it fits it just fine. This is a Tetra Whisper, I believe. Yes. Next up for sponges, we have, of course, intake or pre filter sponges. Now, this is you just take a sponge and you literally stick it on the in tank to your filter. If you have a hang on the back, um, it works so that you don't get plant particles on it. As you can see, I'm sure my are covered with mosses and whatnot that would normally get stuck on the intake and then clog it. Uh, putting the pre filter sponge on helps filter those out from getting inside your hang on the back and clogging. It also prevents if you have fry or smaller fish or even a bigger fish from getting stuck in there. If you have a beta with long flowy fins and you have a higher suction filter on it, you can just put a pre-take intake sponge on it and you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to lose any fry or any fins getting caught in there and you're all good. And when you're cleaning the tank, if you stir a bunch of debris, that also doesn't get sucked up in there and clog your intake either. The other tip that I have for sponges is if you have decor, that has holes in it and you don't want your fish getting in it. I had a couple of caves in my Mabuna tank and I just cut some sponge and stuffed it in there to plug it so that my fish would not get stuck in there because it was exposed as I stuck two things on top of each other. So if you have something that you just seal up, um, it's a great option because it'll just expand with the water. And it, I guess it will add a little filtration as well because the bacteria can build up on it. But yeah, it's just plug a hole or keep stuff out of things if you don't want them in there. The next tip or trick is going to be timer light. This is imperative if you also use live plants like many of us do these days. You're going to want to use timer lights for a couple of reasons. The first of which being is your plants. Your plants are going to want the same type of light cycle every day and it just helps create a more stable environment for your plants to thrive and grow in. The second is so that if you get an algae problem you can troubleshoot by having knowing your lights are consistent you can then determine, okay, I'm going to take my lights from seven hours a day and cut it down to six and see if that helps with the algae problem. If that doesn't help, then you know that your lighting is not the problem. Typically, you're going to probably want to keep your lights on from six to ten hours, depending on your plants and your light requirements for them. Um, I would suggest putting them on when you're going to be in there. So, like, if you work from nine to five every day, set your lights to come on, like, at 5, 30, 6 o'clock when you're going to be home and you can see them. Or set them to come on a little earlier. So set them to come on at three so they're on before you get there and your fish are alive and awake for when you get home. That way you can optimize your viewing pleasure of the fish and not have to worry about turning a light on and off every day. Brings up the other thing. This way you don't have to worry about flipping a switch and say, oh, did I leave the light on? How long did I leave the light on? Did I forget to turn the light on at all? Your fish get used to being on the same cycle of, okay, our light turns on here. This is when we wake up. This is when we know we can expect food soon. It all goes back to trying to create that little ecosystem in your own home. And that's all the fun, right? Trying to create nature in a little glass box. So we just have to try and recreate it as best we can. And the sun sets and rises almost the same time every day. For the most part, we're not going to get into sun times. But for the most part, it rises at the same time every day, sets at the same day, and then... Which brings us to the conversation of what timer to get. You can get something that's simple that I have. You just plug them in, and the electricity from your power strip or your outlet is what keeps it going. So you just turn it to when the time is currently, and then you put the little ticks up or down, and then it just goes as long as there's power problem with that is if you lose power it also stops your spinner so there are some that are smart plugs now you can hook to your phone there are other ones that have internal batteries it really depends on how much you want to spend you can go on amazon and get a double pack for like 10 bucks i'll link the ones that i have they're really simple again you plug them in set the time currently and flip the little ticks to what you need of course they also have power strips which i also have where half of the strip is a timer and the other half is constantly live um, I use that because I have multiple tanks hooked up, so you can get one of those. But however route you choose, timers are a must, really, if you're going to keep live plants. Going in line with that whole food idea and making things easier. I mentioned this before in another video, but me with flake foods, I like feeding flake foods. I just don't like picking up a clump of flake foods and having too many flakes. So what I like to do is I open up the flake food I get, I stick my finger or something else in there, and I swirl the food around and break up the food. I screw the lid back on and I shake the food up. I bang it against my hand, I really get it going, and I make the flakes smaller. Making the flakes smaller for me anyway means I can control the food better, and I can take a pinch, 
and I can slowly drip glue it in, and when I think there's enough food, I stop. Versus having a big flake, having chunks fly over the place, and I also think by breaking up the flake foods, it gives your smaller fish or your more timid fish a little better chance of getting the food. I know my pet's smart, and i never seen this done before. I was lucky enough to be there for feeding one time, and the manager was like, this might look weird, but we do this so even the stragglers get fed. They actually mix their flake foods up with water, then they take a pipette or an eyedropper, and they suck up the food, they bring it over the tank, and they just squeeze it in. That way it gets in the water column and everyone gets a chance to eat it. So it's kind of the same concept. You get the food smaller so that more fish have a chance to get some. I also, again, don't like picking up a big clump of flakes and then having to break them up anyway. So it just saves some time in the long run. And it helps when you're combining, like if you want to combine two foods, if you break them down, you can actually fit more in the containers because those containers are full of bigger flakes. When you break the flakes down, you actually get a little more room in your containers too. next trick is going to be condiment bottles. Those plastic bottles that they put ketchup and mustard in, or really anything these days, oil and vinegar even. Perfect thing for putting your smaller foods in. My foods like the Hikari Fancy Guppy, or the Freeze Dried Cyclops, or even the micro pellets, you get those containers, you put the food in, powdered ones are easy enough, you just shake it or squeeze it to come out. Then, if you have a bigger pellet and you want to put it in here, as long as the hole on the intake is big enough, and usually they are, you can just take a pair of scissors and cut the spout down. So you can regulate how fast they come out and you can also regulate the size of your food. So if you have a bigger pellet, it probably would work for up to two millimeters or slightly bigger. Don't quote me on that one. Um, you just put the food in, cut your lid down, or not your lid, your spout down. There you go. And they're much easier to store, and you don't have to worry about them as much, and it's easier than having to stick your fingers in the bag all the time, or the jar. You just take it, pick it up, open all your lids, and go tank to tank, and just shake some food in. It saves you time, and it's more convenient that way. Next, we have more of a tip than a trick. That would be have backups. So if you have one tank and you have one hang on the back filter, you have one heater, even if you have one thermometer, get a spare of everything. Get a second hang on the back. Get a sponge filter and an air pump to have as a backup. Get an air stone to have as a backup. Get an extra heater. Get two smaller heaters instead of one big heater. Get an extra thermometer in case for some reason yours breaks or you want two types. I personally have the stick-on strip ones and I have the glass ones that go in the tank. Some people like the digital thermometers. I think those are hit or miss, but that's just me personally. Having a backup is going to save you if God forbid your impeller and your hang on the back break and then you have to run out to the, it's a Saturday night, pet store isn't open for another eight and 10 hours. Then you have to run out, get home, install it. This way you have one in your house already and you don't have to worry about it. Same with your heater. If your heater stops working and you go to the pet store, they don't have any. You go to a different pet store, they don't have any. This way you have one on hand already. But just remember, if you reuse your replacement, buy another replacement. So maybe still go to the pet store the next day and then replace your replacement. It's like a spare tire. If you use a spare tire, you gotta get a new spare tire. So it's the same concept as that. This next one again I'm just going to touch on quickly just because it will be in a video in the future more in depth, but that is some type of siphon. If you have multiple tanks or even just one tank, some type of siphoning tube or siphoning tool will help you when it comes to your water changes. If you use airline tubing, it's simple. You stick one end in the tank, the other end in a bucket, you just suck in the water and then gravity does the rest. Just make sure you move so you don't, you know, drink in all that lovely fish tank water. They make things like the python. I personally don't own a python, but from what I've heard and seen, you can drain the water one way and then it literally hooks up to your faucet and you can get water straight from the tap to fill your tanks back up. So it's a quick way to fill your tanks up. Um, going along with this, gravel vacs. You can use gravel vac as siphons. They work the same concept. I have one where you pump it and it creates a siphon for you so you don't have to suck on the water. It's easy, stick one end in the tank, squeeze it, water comes out, dirty stuff comes out. It helps with the water changing. Personally, I don't gravel back because I like to keep all that stuff in there to keep a nice ecosystem, but I will if I notice for some reason it's a giant ammonia spike in my water for six tanks that have been cycled. If I see ammonia go up, then I'll go in there and gravel back out because I clearly overfed. Yeah, getting yourself some type of siphoning implement will help so you don't have to stick a cup in and do it that way.
mentioned it earlier in the video, live plants are, while they might be a hot topic right now and a trend, they also are really beneficial to your tank and the ecosystem in your tank. Especially mosses and floating plants because they will soak up unwanted nitrates in your water and help you keep your water cleaner for your fish. These tanks that I have now are the first time I've gone like full bore live plants and everything more than just one or two plants in a tank i have multiple tanks multiple plants in every tank and i don't have to worry about the water as much especially in smaller tanks it gives you that wider river safety net but don't let it stop you from doing water changes because your fish still need them especially floating plants they really soak it up so if you can get your hands on some red root floaters or some water spangles or some dwarf aquarium lettuce um definitely go with those because they will help soak it up also again the mosses but really all the plants will help soak up that nutrients and break things down more so than just adding chemicals and we don't want to add chemicals to your tank if you don't have to and come on they look nice too who doesn't want to look at a nice lush green tank with fish swimming back and forth no one goes out snorkeling and just looks out into the water with nothing they look at the coral reefs and they look at all the fish swimming around them so if you can recreate something with plants and stuff in your tank and it also helps and is beneficial it's a win-win The next one is going to be, people ask this question all the time, how much do you feed your fish? I'm going to say it's my trick for feeding, feed less more often. So instead of taking a big handful or a big pinch of food or a big clump of pellets or whatever you feed and throwing that in and the whole top of the tank is covered in food, take smaller pinches. Do smaller pinches, smaller scoops, feed two or three times a day instead. That way you can see how much your fish are eating and until you get a feel for it, then you know where you need to correct and course change as to how much you're feeding your fish. If you have a 10 gallon and you have a big flake food, give them one flake, let the fish pick at it, and then see how much they're eating and then you can determine how much you need to feed. If you have a larger community tank, I think feeding multiple times a day is probably better. That way you can ensure all your fish are getting fed. You can feed your bottom feeders at one time and then throw your flake food in. You can feed your flake food and then your bottom feeders, but just, I would say less feeding, less amount of food, more often throughout the day. That way you can gauge your fish's eating habits. Okay, after a couple tricks. The first trick I'm going to mention is if you use a aquarium, which is a word coined by River Life, I'll put a card up for his aquarium video here. Basically, you use a five gallon bucket as an aquarium or you're gonna use a tub and you don't want to worry about having a heater in either one of them. There was a stream one time we talked about ways to get around this. I've actually now had to deal with that as I do have a tub under my desk and it required a heater. Now it's a thinner plastic and even when I was using a five gallon bucket to house some guppies, I wanted a heater in there just to be safe so they were at a slightly warmer temperature because it was still cold out. I ended up taking a large glass, like pint sized glasses, and I stuck my heater in that. This way, the heater was inside a glass container and there was no risk that it was up in contact with the bucket, superheating the plastic to the point where it would melt. Um, I figured this was the best way to do it so that I didn't have to worry about the melting problem. So far, it has been in the tub or bucket for two months now. There have been no problems. Just to be safe and make sure I was getting you know, even distribution of the heat, I stuck the punch filter next to it so that the flow was still there. And the heat has been consistent. But either way, the heat's gonna come out of the glass and the water around the glass and should heat up your tank. And not your tank, your bucket, just fine. Or your tub, whichever one you're trying to heat up that's, you know, plastic. All right, these next two tips kind of go hand in hand. And those are research and patience. Second word most people don't wanna hear because we live in a society where everything is instant and you want your stuff right then and there or the next day. Thank you, Amazon Prime. Unfortunately, fish tanks aren't instant and they require work and patience. They also require research. You should always research the fish before you even buy them. You shouldn't go to the pet store and buy a tank and then say, okay, what fish do I want? You should research your fish first, then decide the size tank you need and what you need for substrates, plants, chemicals, and food. So if you do it the other way, there's a likelihood that something's gonna go wrong and you're gonna lose your fish, which is where the patience factor comes in. When you're looking up your fish, also look up the nitrogen cycle because that's a big part of the fish keeping hobby. Nitrogen cycle is where the patience comes in. Yes, you could set up a tank 
buy the instant start chemicals and immediately throw fish in the tank. But if you're new to fish keeping, you're gonna run into problems that you might not know how to handle if you didn't take the time, be patient, and go and research. So patience is key and the best tip besides research that I can give anybody thinking about or who's already in the hobby because there's always constantly new things coming up and new ways to do things. So be patient, do your research, and you should have an easier time in the hobby. But remember, some things can go wrong even if you do all the research in the world. So that just requires more patience and more research. And we're back to where we started. This next one might upset some people because they're not gonna agree. And that is that snails are not the pests that everyone says they are. I know it's not really everyone, it's just a small group of people, but those small group of people are more vocal online than the majority that say snails are good, so just roll with everybody. Let's see, snails, we got our pond snails, we got our ram's horn snails, we got our apple snails, we got our mystery snails, we got our rabbit snails, we've got our nerite snails, all the snails. Um, personally, I think nerites, ram's horns, and the bladder snails are the most beneficial. Not that the other ones aren't, I just think they do the most for our tanks. That is, that they will eat dead and decaying plant matter. They will help clean up any leftover food. They will help clean up fish waste sometimes. They'll help clean up algae, depending on the type of snail. Personally, I prefer the ram's horns and the nerites over the other ones. Just That's just a personal preference based on the way they look. They also will give you one key hint back to the food subject. If all of a sudden you look in your tank and you're saying, where did all these snails come from? Then you're probably overfeeding your fish. If you overfeed your fish, it gives an ample supply of food to those snails, which will then repopulate, and they repopulate quick. So they're going to be your first warning sign you're feeding too much. Next warning sign is going to be an ammonia spike and your fish gasping for air or floating at the top. So the snails are like your early warning system. They will also tell you if there's enough calcium in your water. Because if you have snails, you notice their shells are crackling or getting thinner. Then you know your water doesn't have a lot of calcium, which your fish also need to help keep their spines straight. So that's another good thing that snails do besides waste removal and letting you know your water parameters. So remember, snails are friend, not food. I shouldn't get copyrighted for that because it's a completely different quote. But yes, snails are beneficial and they're part of a complete balanced ecosystem in your tank. So don't let anyone ever tell you that snails are just pest snails and they eat your plant. Because in reality, and don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure there's only like four types of snails that actually eat your plants. Like as a food source. And most of them are illegal in the fish keeping hobby anyway, at least in the US. This again is probably another tip, not so much a trick, but if you notice anything funky going on in your tank at all, your initial response probably should be, do a water change. Nine times out of ten, that's probably going to fix the problem, because usually your fish are reacting to something wrong in your water parameters. So if, for instance, I had my fish that were all swimming up top one time, gasping for air, they were pale in color. I didn't know what was going on, but I immediately grabbed a bucket, I grabbed a siphon tube, and I started draining water and adding fresh water at the same time the old water was draining. What ended up happening there was that I, uh, I put in medication the night before and increased the temperature, and then I didn't realize that increasing the temperature deoxygenated the water, so there was less oxygen in for the fish, and I had been turning my filter down because I couldn't sleep at night. There was less agitation in the water, which of course, again, meant less oxygen. So my fish were literally suffocating to death. So luckily I was able to do a water change and it fixed them and they were fine. Same thing if you notice any medical problems. If you notice you got ick or you notice a fungus or bacteria infection, still change the water and then add your meds. Just it, that extra step will help and sometimes can solve the problem before it's a big, bigger issue. And you gotta do a weekly water change anyway. So if it's three days before your water change and your fish are acting funny, just do your water change early. And even if you do a small one like 25 or 30% instead of a 50%, just do some type of water change and hopefully that helps your problem. For our next tip, this will be another one that's also going to be covered more detailed in another video because it's an essential. That is some type of test kit, whether it be the test strips or be the vials and chemicals. Personally, I use both, 
but that's just because I have major OCD with things and I like to double check everything. So I use the test strips and I use the liquids. So get yourself an API master test kit or any test kit. Personally, I only know of the API. I don't know of other companies that make them, so that's why I'm saying API. But if you know of a different company and you trust them, go ahead and get those. Or the API test strips. Even if you just get the test strips, that's the better than nothing. The only problem with the test strips is they don't test for ammonia, so you have to get a separate ammonia strip. The good thing about the master kit is it comes with all that. But again, the downside of the master kit is it doesn't test for KH and GH. So you have constations you're going to need to also pick up with the GH and KH testing kits. But the good thing about that is those are on the test strips, so it's it's a catch-22. They don't put ammonia on the test strips, so you have to buy another test strip. They don't put KH and GH testing in the master kit, so you have to get a separate test anyway. So that's another reason I use both. Yeah, either way, just pick yourself up some kind of testing kit, even if it honestly just has ammonia and it's better than nothing, and you should be able to gauge where your tank is based on that. People are probably getting mad at me in the comments for saying that because they're going to say there's, there's nitrates and nitrates too you have to worry about, which again, I'm going to cover another video. I'm just saying, get yourself a testing kit of some kind. Now for the last trick. This is something I thought about when I was going to do outdoor tubs and I wanted an air stone in there just to make sure the water circulated well and I didn't get a biofilm on top and you know mosquitoes because we have mosquitoes that breed in my backyard. I wanted a way where I could keep an air stone or an air pump in there without having to run an extension cord and the way I came up to do that was buy a USB air pump. Um, Aquarium Co-op sells them so they're I would go there because I would trust them. Then buy yourself a solar charger. They sell them on Amazon. Get yourself one of those solar chargers that unfolds and take your USB air pump, plug it into that charger, take some um, electrical tape, wrap it over the connection so it's watertight, and there you go. You've got a constant supply of energy for the um, air pump. Worst case, get a couple of those battery packs that they sell for charging things keep like three of those and just change them out the only problem with that is they might die overnight so you don't then you would have to worry about the morning but solar air charger with a usb air pump i think is a great way to get your pond or your tub some movement and agitation in the water without having to run electricity to it if you need to make the connection a little longer they also sell extension cords for usbs um it just has male and female ends you plug one end into your charger you get a little extra cord and then you plug your pump into that but again electrical tape both connections on both ends that way it's a watertight seal and you don't have to worry about any short circuits or anything While I am editing this, I realized that I forgot two tips and tricks that I wanted to mention. Uh, the first one being that I know a lot of us, if we go out of town, worry about people feeding our fish that aren't used to the tanks and might overfeed or underfeed. Most people are probably going to overfeed though. So I was trying to think of a way that when I go out of town, now that I have more tanks instead of just one, how could I make it so it's easier on the person that's feeding my fish to feed them and not overfeed? This is when the idea of using a pill container came into my mind. So we've probably all seen them if we have elderly grandparents or know someone that's older and they have to take a bunch of pills morning, noon, night, every day of the week. It's a little plastic strip. It's got, you can get ones for the days or ones for the week or both with morning and noon on them. And the whole idea is that you can buy one of those for your tank, put in the amount of food that you wanna feed, close it, it's sealed. You can say, here you go. This is what you're gonna feed, just open it up and dump it in the tank, and then you don't have to worry about if they're overfeeding or underfeeding. Just thought that would be an easy way instead of saying, okay, give people a pinch of food because your pinch is gonna be different than my pinch. And yeah, this way I figured you give them the exact amount of food you want the tank fed, and then you don't have to worry about them feeding the wrong food or too much food. And the other more tip that I have, it's not really a tip, it's just a suggestion. Uh, if you buy a betta fish or beta fish, like I say, um, from the PetSmart or Petco or wherever you get them, if they come in the cup, save the cup because you're going to realize that cup is going to come in a lot more handy than you think. Uh, so far, I have used the cups for doing water changes on much smaller tanks like my two and a half gallons. 
I just recently used the cup to help fill up a two and a half gallon actually so that I didn't disrupt the sand. If you're doing water tests on a bunch of tanks and just want to keep reusing vials, you could just dump the liquid in those cups and be fine and not to worry about it. You can also use them as a quick little, here I gotta put you in a cup real quick before I transfer you to a different tank if the other tank isn't ready yet or you can't find a net. You can just put the fish in there and it would work out. Um, I have also used the cups for rehydrating food. I will take the food, put it in with some tank water and swish it around so I can rehydrate food with that. I've also used the lids from the beta cups. I have used them to disperse the bubbles from a sponge filter so that my floating plants have less agitation. So there's several uses for those as well. And I'm sure someone else will think of something in the comments that I haven't used them for or thought of yet. But yeah, that's it for tips. I'll probably end up doing another one of these at some point. Thank you very much for watching. Please, as always, remember to hit that like button, leave a comment, good or bad, as long as you comment, because it makes me know that people are watching the video. I do genuinely like interacting with people in the comment sections when I can, so it does help me when people comment, because then I can have a conversation with them. And share the video if you liked it. Uh, if you haven't hit the subscribe button, do that. Uh, since we did just hit 100 subscribers, and I did just do a food giveaway not that long ago, I think I'm going to hold off until 200 for the next giveaway. I've already got it picked out in my head what I'm going to do. I'll probably give away a small aquarium kit from PetSmart. So unfortunately, it's probably going to be US only. But if you're international, I will look into some way of getting you some. I think that's equivalent if you do end up winning when that happens, which will be, again, at 200 subs. I will put links for the stuff in the video down below, and catch you guys in the next one. Thank you again for watching.